Okay, good morning. Good morning. My name is Gary Matsuoka, and this is Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. And this morning's class is on to growing tomatoes, kind of a beginner's class, so we're talking about the basics today. So the tomatoes easily is the number one crop that homeowners grow in as a, as a food crop. So almost everybody grows tomatoes every year, primarily because they taste better when you grow them yourself. Um, this class today is kind of dedicated to a good friend uh, who passed away recently. Steve Goto was Mr. Tomato in Southern California as far as the other nurseries are concerned. And he said he got his uh, calling because he was, well, he first was easy, he was a banker. And then he got into produce distribution. And he says he just got sick and tired of sending the tomatoes from the supermarkets from state to state to state to state traveling the country trying to sell them to the supermarkets. They were green. Every so often they would turn color and the supermarkets would buy them and they'd, they'd have the same tomatoes on the same truck for like a month. So that's how uh, store tomatoes are sold. They're picked green and, and they ship them around until somebody buys them. Anyway, so he got to start that way. Uh, that was back in the early 90s, late 80s, and uh, uh, nowadays uh, the heirlooms are the main thing. So one of the things we'll talk about is what's the difference between an heirloom and a hybrid. There's not much. Um, it's mainly what their genetics look like. So. Now, just so you know, there was one tomato we had 20, 30 years ago that was genetically modified. That is, bred in a lab instead of in a greenhouse. And that one is gone. It wasn't, uh, they were trying to make a tomato that had a better shelf life. And no one liked it, so it was kind of went by the wayside. So that no one's done anything since. But generally, heirloom tomatoes Plants, uh, tomatoes generally have two chromosomes just like we do. And on heirlooms, the two chromosomes are kind of more or less identical. And on a hybrid, they're different. So an heirloom is kind of like inbred for seven generations. And if you inbreed that long, then all your genetics at that point become pretty much the same. Hybrids they maintain two different parents. So like my wife is Euro uh, European, I'm Asian, our kids are hybrids. Um, if our kids breed together for seven generations, then, then they'll probably all look the same. But then it's an heirloom. So the modern definition of an heirloom is, you know, the old definition was, yeah, it was passed down from generation to generation, it was a favorite of the families. And that's how it should be. But nowadays, they can turn a hybrid tomato into an heirloom just by breeding it with itself for seven generations. You throw out the weird, weird ones, and you try to keep the, the same line going. So in theory, the heirlooms are a little more distinctive because all their genes are the same. So they often have more distinctive characteristics and flavors. The hybrids generally are sturdier plants. because they've got more genes in them that, you know, from one line of plants, they might be immune to one disease, and from another line of tomatoes, one heirloom tomato might be resistant to a different disease. You combine the two and get an heirloom, I'm a hybrid, and then now it's resistant to two diseases. So that's how they, that's why they made hybrids in the first place. So the, the first hybrids produced, I believe was in the 1940s. And I believe the first one that was introduced and promoted that way was Big Boy. I'm not per positive, but Burpee was one of the major companies that started breeding tomatoes a long, long time ago. Uh, they, um, their Big Boy, uh, they held the genetics of that in secret for generations until the, uh, they said one of the last breeders of the original one was uh, about Donnie, release the names of the plants that they use. But 
anyway, it's interesting what they did. So the hybrid tomatoes and pretty much the hybrids, the reason they made them, and I always tell people this, they're bred to live among the dead. <laughs> so the problem we have with homeowners is that most homeowners don't rotate crops really well. So on farms, they know not to plant tomatoes in the same plot for at least three years, two years without tomatoes, one year with, two years without tomatoes, one year with. Well, most homeowners never do that. And the problem they have is that the dead tomato plants that are existing, it's not much, it's like, you know, then the, when you grow a tomato plant or any plant, could be a pumpkin, anything, about 1% of the ground is filled with the dead roots after you remove the plant. Uh, that's all it takes. So, you know, just think of your house. If your house is filled with 1% of your house was dead grandparents' bodies scattered all around, and you try to raise the baby in that, it's not, it doesn't work as well as if those pieces weren't there. Same with any plant. The little pieces of dead stuff from the previous year cause trouble for several years until they're all, you know, used up by the uh, fungi and the bacteria to take care of them and then it's safe to put them again. But the hybrids, they got genetics from several heirlooms that made it possible, more easy for them to live among dead roots of the previous generation. So suddenly, when they made those hybrid tomatoes, most of the homeowners thought, well, boy, tomatoes are easier to grow. So they are bred to live among diseases that promote root diseases. So. Uh, So they said it only takes seven generations of a hybrid. So if you take a hybrid, so generally, if you combine two heirlooms and you get a hybrid, well, on most cases, not, you know, every hybrid is different, but if you have babies from this thing, two of them should resemble the hybrid and two should resemble the two parents. If it's simple genetics, it may be more complicated than that. So what you do if you're creating an heirloom from a hybrid is you throw away the ones that don't look like it, keep the ones that do, and keep recrossing them for seven more generations until they all look like the hybrid. And then you can call it an heirloom. So that's kind of cheating, but that's what they do with a lot of the hybrids, because hybrid seeds are real expensive. I mean, they're like, uh, you know, heirloom seeds may be pennies per seed, hybrid tomato seeds because someone's got to take the original mom and the original dad and cross them in a lab so there's no other contamination from pollen around and then they take the seeds out of the fruit. Um, that, usually these seeds run 30 cents a piece retail, even more. Whereas these are more like pennies a piece. So a lot of times they, the growers will take hybrids, turn them into heirlooms, and sell them as an heirloom version of the hybrid. And that happens a lot, you'll see heirloom versions. But again, not a huge difference. I mean, most heirlooms, again, are more distinctive looking and tasting than the hybrids. But some of our favorite tomatoes are the hybrids. There are some really good hybrids out there. So, mm-hmm. Roots, yeah. So now, if, if it's turned back into an heirloom, does it lose the ability to live in the dead? It may, oh. because you're back down to one, you know, one set of genes instead of two sets. It wouldn't carry over necessarily. It might. It depends which set the heirloom picked up. <laughs> no, you just don't know. I mean, it's hard to tell. I mean, I guess someone can do a genetic study of tomatoes. I don't know if they've done it yet, where they've taken each gene and and sequenced it to see what what it makes it up. So. Um, or, you know, they, they uh, about 10 years ago, there was a big thing on grafting tomatoes, where you can graft the tomato to a superior root, which is not that hard to do, but it's a pain in the rear, and it's, you know, just to avoid root diseases, it's easier just to get clean dirt than it is to uh, graft them, I think. <laughs> so, but there are some, we, we, we had, we sold grafted tomatoes for a few years, and they are, much more resistant to 
inclement weather. I mean, I mean, a lot of them will just go right on through winter because a lot of the uh, roots we were grafting to were very cold hardy. So, uh, and a lot of them are very disease resistant. And what they did is they took some wild tomatoes that aren't, you know, just wild. So they're real strong t types and they grafted on the, the heirlooms to them and made the heirlooms as good as wild. So if you go to uh, hothouse operations where, you know, the hothouses are real expensive to operate, almost all those companies use grafted, well, not all of them. Uh, a significant portion of them use grafted tomatoes because it's so expensive to operate a greenhouse, you want your strongest tomato plant that can live a long time too. But certainly there's plenty of them that don't do that. But there is a company in Oregon that specializes in grafting tomatoes and they send them all across the United States. And that's the company we got them from back in the 19, no, 20, about 2010, 2011. Well, the graft tomatoes cost about two to three times as much, well, three times as much as this, uh, well, four times as much, four times as much as a seed-grown tomato. So, um, so they're quite expensive, but they can live, you know, especially in a hothouse, they can live three or four years. So you can have the same plant for quite a while. So, Okay, as far as sunlight goes, um, of course, full sun can give you potentially the most crop, more light, more energy. However, most, green, most tomatoes are grown in greenhouses and the lighting's maybe 60, 70 percent. So they don't need the entire day. Um, and there are a lot of operations that are indoors too, and they're operating on maybe half the light. I mean, we've at our house, we've experimented a lot. We put tomatoes on the north side where they get maybe four hours of sun a day. We got a good crop. Uh, I'm sure the amount of substance in the fruit wasn't as good as the ones in full sun. So it's interesting. They've done studies like on citrus. I haven't seen it on tomatoes, but on citrus, they've done studies on oranges growing on the south side of a tree versus oranges growing on the north side. They said they can't tell any difference human-wise between the flavors. But the, t the citrus grown on the south side of the tree had much more content, much more sugar in it, much more acids, much, just much more nutrition in that fruit, even though they could not tell any difference in flavor between the two. So the sunlight packs in a lot more nutrition, nutrients into that fruit, but not necessarily, doesn't necessarily change the flavor. I mean, you know, we're not a third world country. It's not like we need the tomatoes to be the most nutritious. We do want them to be better tasting. Because when I grew tomatoes on the north side of my house, you know, they tasted fine. So, um, would less sun make grow slower? Maybe not. I mean, it's hard. It depends what you mean by growing. Some plants just stretch in the shade. So they, you know, it's not, it's not more volume or it's not more substance to the plant, they just stretch. So plants in the shade really grow fast, but it's not necessarily good growth. So, so in the, in the shade, yeah, they do tend to grow faster. Okay, uh, soil wise, they're not picky. That's one good thing about tomatoes. Um, any soil you want, as long as it's not under, not this boggy, a pond, it's not a pond, you're okay. Because my first house I lived at uh, when I was a teenager and started growing tomatoes was just solid clay. They did fine. Um, but generally what happens, the more airy the soil is, the faster they grow. So in all hothouse operations, they don't use clay. They use the opposite. You see a lot of tomatoes in hothouses being grown in perlite which is very, very airy. So the more air you can get to the roots, so in the, in the soil for roots, air is the limiting factor. Um, they, you know, and generally soils can provide ample water as long as you water it. You can provide the nutrition and then the, dis, the difference is the air to the roots. The more air the roots get, the faster, it's oxygen actually, the more oxygen the roots get, the faster they can grow. 
on the top of the plant, uh, generally the, besides sunlight, the limiting factor is carbon dioxide. So most of the hothouses, they inject carbon dioxide into those hothouses and make those tomatoes really grow fast because carbon dioxide is the source of, of the, well, they turn carbon dioxide into sugar and they turn sugar into cellulose. The plants are made out of cellulose, wood's made out of cellulose. So carbon dioxide has been the limiting factor in the atmosphere for growing tomatoes. So they'll up it maybe 10 times what it normally is to get those things going. So, And uh, they said almost all farmers noticed that in the last 20 years, uh, their crops are growing way faster than they used to <laughs> because of the, you know, our, our, the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere have gone from, what, about 220 50 years ago to 440 just lately, 440 parts per million. And that's it. So it's almost doubled. Well, it's pretty much doubled. It's probably closer to 500 parts per million now. Now, we will die if it hits 100,000 parts per million. But that, there's a long way to go there. So, uh, okay. Um, so soil-wise, almost any soil, they're really not picky. We would like to give them the best soil possible. So if one of our friends over at uh, Orange County Farm Supply, he grew them in a bag of chicken manure. And they'll take manure. I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. They'll actually grow in that. I'm sure they'll do better in a bag of sand. Uh, so sand is one of the better soils to grow them in. They'll grow faster in that just because of the air. Uh, we sell two potting soils that we would prefer. Um, our top pot. And generally, most of our customers that grow tomatoes, and when we grow tomatoes too, we usually use our acid mix, which is this pumice and peat moss half and half. And that's a real airy mix to grow them in. Um, we're not a fan of majority of potting soils out there which contain mostly ground up trees. So if it says recycled forest products, that's a dead tree. It's not as good. I mean, they'll make it. Um, they'll be a little more prone to, prone to root rot because it's a dead plant that's decomposing in your, in your pot or in the ground. If you put that stuff in the ground, it's, it is decomposing quite rapidly. It's not related to tomatoes, but it can cause uh, certain conditions that they don't like. But again, tomatoes, most tomatoes are really tolerant of bad soil. So uh, we do promote our acid mix in our top pot, potting soils. Uh, the difference between those, the acid mix holds a little more moisture, so it'll stay wetter longer. Uh, the top pot, um, is a little more permanent, a little more, a little less peat moss, a little more permanent materials in there. So it'll uh, dry out a little bit quicker, but it's not that different. It's like maybe it's 50% peat to 35% peat. It's not that huge a difference. Okay. Um, as far as when to grow them, so the the temperatures that are ideal for growing a crop, you want your nights to be above 55 degrees Fahrenheit and your days to be below 85. So that's the sweet spot of tomatoes, minimum to maximum. Uh, that's when your flowers, they make set fruit really well. So you can say right now, I mean today, we're in that range. Um, I mean, this coming week we won't be. It's supposed to drop down to the 40s again. So at night, so it's still winter. But uh, a lot of our customers come in here in January because they want to get their plants, you know, five, six foot tall by the time this weather hits us. And usually it's early spring. We get, you know, well, every year it's different. Last year, I don't know, we, we were so cool last year for a long time. We didn't, may not have hit this until late April. But, uh, you know, 30 years ago, this was May temperature, you know. We didn't get out of the 40s until the end of April. So, but 55 to 85 is when the flowers work the best. 
when the when it's too cool or too warm, the structure of the flower is kind of off. The way that the flowers are made, so they hang upside down. They got the petals, they got the female parts, and the male pollen. So when they're made properly, the female part is longer than the male parts, and the pollen files falls from there right onto the female part, and the pollination occurs. When the weather's not right, either the male pollen's not developing right, or a lot of times when it's hot, we've been told is that the female part is too short, and the male parts are too long, and the pollen misses. But other things can be going on too, it's just too hot for that pollen to survive too long, something goes on. So they say in the summertime, if you want to get better crops, uh, jiggle, you vibrate your plants a bit, get this pollen, see if you can get it up, flying around a little better. Because if it just drops, it's going to miss. So anyway, 55 to 85, that's usually April through June when we have uh, really good, you know, lots of, all the flowers turning into fruit. Then it happens again usually late September, October, into November. The spring crop is better because as the fruit's developing, it's getting warmer. The fall crop can be small just because uh, it's getting colder <laughs> as the fruit's developing. So. And there are some tomatoes that are meant to take the heat too. So there's some that, like we have Cherokee purple out there, they said that's meant to take hotter temperatures in the daytime. Okay, so that's the temperature range. So um, a lot of our customers want to start early. The problem with starting early, now we used to get frost and that would have been a problem, but it hasn't happened at all this year. Uh, there might have been one day where it was getting close to freezing, but it hasn't happened much. Now, you know, uh, the last chance of frost is March 15th, which is tomorrow. So it's, it's not going to happen this year. <laughs> I mean, some years, you know, we go, okay, the first week of March, oh, no frost. We bring in delicate plants, and then we get a freeze. So uh, we learn our lesson, don't bring them in before March 15th. But uh, this year, no sign of it, so we'll be fine. Um, the other thing is rain. So, the you know, we have a tomato disease book. And if you ever look at it, it's pretty, um, it, it won't make you very happy because, you, you know, the, there's like, uh, and they said they, this one's no longer being, this book has been discontinued because they found about 20 or 30 more diseases. So this has got about 50 tomato diseases in it. Uh, and the new book, I think, has closer to 100 diseases in it. So there's so many things that go wrong with your tomatoes, it's just crazy. There's, you know, you look at each page, you say, well, I've seen that, and I've seen that. <laughs> Every one of these things uh, you can get. But the main thing to know about diseases is that generally we don't treat them. Um, if you get a real bad case, you just throw the plant away and start over. I mean, there are products that can control disease, but they cost generally way more than your crop will ever be worth. So you might as well just start over with a new plant. Um, now, so most tomato diseases happen, well, besides the root ones. So the root ones, you avoid those by putting them in virgin soil or soil that hasn't grown tomato for at least two years. So you avoid the tomato dis root diseases. Um, the foliar diseases generally are started by water sitting on the leaf. Now, water touching the leaf is not a problem. In fact, if you spray water on the leaves on the plant, you knock off a lot of spores that are on the plant. Diseases start by spores. Usually it's either fungal spore, bacteria spore, uh, something like that. And if you wash the leaves off, there's no problem. It's just if the water droplet sits there unchanged for like three or four hours. Then a new spore come over to the water droplet, germinate in the water droplet, take its time, develop 
until it can infect the leaf. So the water has to sit there for hours and hours before it can affect the plant. So in the morning you go out there and you, your plant's covered with dew. Just take the hose and blast it. You knock off any spore that's in that water and then it's got to start over, but by the time it starts over, your, your water droplet's probably drying off about midday. So, uh, water isn't necessarily the bad guy, but if it sits there too long. Now, if you only have one plant in your yard and it rains on it, chances of getting disease are pretty small. Uh, if it's, especially if it's this size, because it's got plenty of air circulation, the water will probably dry off real quickly. And if you don't have old, disease plants from the year before sitting around, not a big deal. If your plant is already this big and real full of leaves and it, and it gets wet, the center of that thing doesn't draw off too well. So there's a lot more chance of getting diseases once the plant's big and full than it is when it's small like this. So there are reasons the way, there's some ways we train tomatoes and there's reasons for that is to prevent disease. Not as likely, so generally we don't worry too much about spores splashing off the ground onto the plant unless there's you know, some sick leaves sitting on the ground. Um, they did a study on rose gardens where they said, okay, what happens if we sterilize the ground every winter or not sterilize it? They didn't find any difference. They said most of the diseases for rose leaves don't survive on the ground. Once they're off the leaf and on the dirt, some other fungi, bacteria, eats them up. So there's a lot of biological activity happening on the ground and most diseases that affect leaves don't survive well on, on the ground. So we won't worry as much unless you have you know, a bunch of dead tomato leaves sitting on the ground there. Uh, but they did say there's so many spores floating in the air, that's why it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> you know? So you assume there's disease spores floating around in the air. Especially by mid-year when everybody's growing, you know, tomato plants are already alive and a lot of dying leaves by that time, then there's a lot more spores in the air by midsummer than there are early in the year like now. So would that be why a lot of people think that it could be coming from the soil? Because I've seen a lot of plants that start going yellow and they just the yellow stuff to try to work its way. Well yeah. Um, they certainly most plants get disease from the bottom because those are the oldest leaves. A lot of those are already dying because just from age. And the, and the fact that when they get wet, those leaves stay wetter longer, usually near the ground. So, uh, so we, we'll talk about that when we're training them. Um, Fertilizer-wise, nothing unusual on tomatoes, just a typical crop. So we generally just say, if you get a good vegetable fertilizer, you're fine. They're not that sensitive to the difference. I mean, I've grown tomatoes when I was a kid without fertilizer. I thought, I didn't know anything about fertilizer, just threw them in the ground. And they did okay. So they're not, they're not a super heavy user of fertilizer. And a lot of the uh, articles warn about over fertilizing, you get leaves instead of flowers and fruit. But you will need to put down something. Now, we usually like to stay organic in the garden in a pot when we grow stuff in pots, we often start with an osmocote, which is not organic. Uh, this is one of the better chemical fertilizers, uh, just because it's faster. If you put an organic fertilizer in one of our potting soils, or any, almost any potting soil where nature is not there at the moment, then it takes longer for these to work. Now, the difference between this and this, they're both made by Dr. Earth, and there's a lot of copy, well, there's a lot of similar products all over the, from the other uh, brands, is that this is a, a blend of organic sources. So this one, it'll say on here, uh, fish bone meal, bone meal, feather meal, alfalfa meal, fish meal, kelp meal, and all kinds of stuff, kelp flour. This one, they take the same ingredients and break them down. So in, generally when you put this in the soil, it's got to be broken down by bacteria in the ground or fungi in the ground before the plant can get it. So it takes, you know, three weeks, maybe longer if the soil is cold. This one has already been broken down at the factory by bacteria and other things. 
so it works quite a bit faster than this one, maybe twice as fast. Uh, this one smells like a dead rat, and that's what things smell like when they're breaking down. This one doesn't smell bad at all. Uh, again, with organics, do watch your pets. You know, dogs like to would probably eat this one. <laughs> I don't know if they'll eat this one. This one smells pretty bad. Uh, that's well, they promote it that way, and you can smell it too. I mean, when I when we were next to an organic farm for four years. I mean, when they're fertilizing their crops, you can, it would just, it just really reeked out there, you know. It's like they're pouring sewage all over their crops. Because, you know, with the organic farms, they need the stuff to grow really fast. And if they put down an unbroken organic, they got to do it before the crop gets put in because it needs time to, to start working. So they put down the stuff, they all use stuff like this. And they usually, usually use it in liquid form because they put it in through their, um, their irrigation system, so it really reeks. It's like it came. Uh, this it'll tell you on here. Yeah. yeah, when they say life on it, I guess because it's been dead longer. Or <laughs> anyway, it works it works faster. Or you can just you know throw the fertilizer in the ground a month before you get started, and then it's got time to break down. So. So it needs a little more time. I mean, uh, a lot of times we'll use this for the first feeding and put this on at the same time. So this kicks in when it can. Okay, um, so fertilizer. Water-wise, you need ample water. Um, you know, you don't want your plants to think they're in a drought because then they just stop. Uh, generally, the roots of plants, if you're in a pot, you just water, make sure the entire soil is moist top to bottom. In the ground, you want to make sure that you've got moisture at least a foot deep. Now, tomatoes are more drought tolerant than other crops, but still, um, if you back off in the water at all, they just stop growing. Uh, that's how they you know, save themselves, they stop growing. So if you want them to grow amply, make sure you keep the top foot of soil moist at all times when you're growing that. And the only way you can tell that, because there's mo most of the moisture meters don't go in that deep, just get a, a piece of rebar or any metal rod, wood dowel that's at least pencil thick, and see how, well, it doesn't have to be that thick, it can be thinner, but see how far you can push into the dirt. If the dirt's moist enough for the plant to get water out of it, you can push a stick through it. So if you can push a stick in the ground next to your tomato plant about a foot deep, you're fine. If you only down, go down four inches, you've got to water either more frequently or more deeply. Usually more frequently it works better. Just water, um, you know, several days in a row until you get the water back down to a foot and keep it, try to keep it a foot deep. So if something's growing in your in your top lot next, then this rain would be having so many days in a row with so limited sun, how would the plants do in this condition? Well, they like it wet. No, um, a lot of uh, tomato plants can be grown hydroponically. So there are a lot of growers who grow them in, quote, gutters, where it's just, this, it's actually a rain gutter. It's hanging about six feet off the ground in the greenhouse, and they stick the roots in that, and the plants just hang down from there. So they're in water all their lives, and those, those are the ones that can go four or five years. I mean, it's interesting. They said that Every so often they know the roots are getting old and the stem's getting too long, so what they do is they stick the stem into the gutter, wait till it roots out, cuts off the, the, the old end of that, and then it shortens the stem hanging down. So every so often they stuff more into the gutter so it roots into the gutter. Right, they can keep it going for almost indefinitely that way. So, but yeah, just living in straight water. So, so. this combination of weather, sun basically and a lot of rain, that's, that's okay for the plant? Well, it's still pretty bright and uh, as long as the leaves, you know, the leaves, the water didn't sit there and make them disease. Now, if you see, the one thing to do to note is that a lot of the disease has started as a spot on the leaf. You'll see a little yellow spot and then turns black in the middle. If you pick that off, you've cured the plant. The problem is if you see the spot starting on the main stem, 
then you got to cut the stem off and hopefully it regrows from below it. So if the stem gets infected, you can be in trouble. If the, it's just a leaf, you just pick that leaf right off of there and you cure it that way. So just be vigilant. That's the easiest way to stop disease is just pick them off. Because at the organic farm we're next to, you know, almost every day you see people walk in the fields with a little bucket in their hand and they're just cleaning the plants up. They, they do that rather than try to spray, you know, that it's organic, so they can't spray them with anything except for maybe an oil spray, so, which they do all the time. You see these sprayers going down and it's oil, you can smell it, but, uh, so, okay, on uh, tomatoes, um, the main pesticides that we use, uh, you know, organic pesticide, the primary one's going to be something that contains spinosad. So this is Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. The product, the chemical name in there is spinosad. It's an ingredient apparently found in a rum distillery, so it's a part of rum. Um, so they consider it edible to people to eat because most people have drunk rum in their life, so it's in there. And it happens to kill uh, Several important pests, uh, caterpillars, generally chewing bugs, so beetles, caterpillars. Um, the main thing though, new one that goes after is thrips. So the main caterpillar, of course, uh, the tomato hornworm. That's, you know, that stops a lot of people from growing tomatoes once they see that thing. <laughs> Usually they're out, the uh, tomato hornworm comes out around July and all the way to November. When I was a kid, I used to raise those things. I mean, I mean they're so loud you can hear them eating. <laughs> so the, uh, the, there's the big hawk moth. I mean, it looks like a hummingbird in the evening. So it comes out just as dust is on your plants and they hatch out of the ground around July, they fly around, look for those tomato plants, and you see this thing just zipping down to your tomato plant, they're laying eggs just that speed. So they're real quick, and then they take off and fly away. The caterpillar hatches out, first week of its life it's like that big, you don't, it might make one hole in the leaf, second week it's about that big, might eat one leaf. By the third week it's this big, it's an entire branch, and by the fourth week it's like three or four inches long and it's consuming mass quantities of your plant. So generally if you hit them with spinel, so this lasts two weeks on the plant. So if you hit them once a month starting in July, they won't have time to get big enough to do much damage. Or you can just go out there and hand pick. Most people don't, you know, it, it is kind of nerving when you touch them. You can feel their body tense up. <laughs> and sometimes you pull them off the plant, their legs are still on the plant, they're holding it so tight you just break all their legs off. So, uh, so one trick, because you know, I raised caterpillars, so caterpillars relax when you hit them on the rear end, because they think it's the head of another caterpillar butting them on the end. So if you hit them on the end of their body, the, the, the butt end, then they release and start walking, you can easily pick them off. If you hit them on the head end, then they freeze. So uh, one thing to know about caterpillars. Oh, good. I forgot about that. So one of the other critters that's real common on tomatoes is leaf miner. So the leaves have this silvery trail in them, and that's a little caterpillar or it could be a maggot. There's maggots and caterpillars that are leaf miners that hollow out inside the leaf. Somehow spinosad goes right through the leaf and gets those guys too. Now thrips are the new guy on the block. So there's a thrip out there called a chili thrip. It goes after chili plants even worse than tomatoes, but you know, come, like last year we didn't see the chili thrips until August. Usually it's, if it's hot for two or three weeks then they start appearing. So most years it's more like July, but if your new growth just starts failing and disappearing, the leaves start falling off, that's the chili thrips. They cause little gray streaks on the new growth and they'll just defoliate a plant. Uh, and the uh, spinosad is the best thing we have organically for them. Although, um, if you, sp you know, they, what the book says to do is spray spinosad twice 
the last two weeks and then switch to something else because any bug that's left after that, like spinosad is supposed to kill 95% of all thrips. Well, that's not 100%. So after two applications, that 5% left is immune, come at it with something else like either an oil spray, which may only kill 5%, but it might be the right 5%. Or uh, here's a new product that we are looking at, Dr. Final Stop. So this one, uh, a lot of the nurseries and farms are looking at these products seriously because what this is is a mixture of, you know, like this neem oil has only got one oil in it. This is a mixture of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different essential oils, all food grade. So if you're using a food grade material on your crop, you don't have to tell the government. Like if we spray anything here at the nursery, I got to tell the government. If it's got an EP listing on the label, you got to tell them. You have to record it and post it to their website that you sprayed a chemical that's registered by the EP on your crop. If you use this, if I use this, don't have to say anything because this is this is stuff you can eat. So this is. Uh, Rosemary oil, sesame oil, peppermint oil, thyme oil, cinnamon oil, and garlic oil. And these plants, you know, the rosemary, the sesame, they make these oils, well not sesame necessarily, but peppermint, thyme, they make the oils to deter or kill pests that are trying to eat them. And if you get that many different oils together in one product, that's going to, you know, that seems to do a good job killing bugs of different kinds. So. Um, so this will probably become more prevalent in the future and hopefully so far they haven't made a concentrate for us to use. This is uh, ready to use. They have one, a concentrate you can attach to your hose. So you can take that out, you know, cut the top off and pour it in the sprayer and use it that way. What about spider? Uh, oil sprays. Oil is the best thing we have for spider mites. So spider mite, now spider mites generally appear if your plants are real full. They're little, you know, spider mites are spiders. They're actually tiny spiders and instead of um, injecting poison to insects and sucking out the body contents, that's what regular spiders do. The spider mites do the same thing to individual cells in a plant. So on an older tomato plant, especially when it's real dense in there, the spider mites, you know, there are predator mites that eat spider mites, but when, they're, when the plant is real dense, sometimes the predator mites don't find them. And you'll see lots of little webs between the leaves, and the green in your leaf starts disappearing because the spider mites are sucking out one cell at a time, and your leaf is turning white slowly. And all that poison they put into disintegrate the contents of each cell is starting to mess up the foliage so that that causes trouble now spider mites oil is still the most effective uh, pesticide but if you blast them with water you know if you had to get a hose out and blast your plant really good with water you'll get like 95 percent on them with just one one good burst and just do that week after week you'll get them that way too but generally, when I was a kid, my first tomato plant, you know, what I did is I found one on the side of the road, pulled it out, totally wilted, put in the ground in my back, my parents' yard, within a couple of days it recovered, full of spider mites, but left it alone. Eventually, the good mites found them, ate them up, and the plant did really well. It had leaf miners real bad. Eventually, the good predator bugs found them, they cured them. Um, of course, the caterpillars, uh, they can just destroy your plants. So that's the only one you should go after. But leaf miners and spider mites, generally nature will control it if you're patient. Thrips, though, that's, there's no, unfortunately, the, no good cure for thrips at, the, at this point. We don't have a good cure for that one. It can. The problem with thrips is, uh, you know, is, is that they make the leaves warp and they hide in there. So sometimes it's real hard to get them. Like, like ficuses right now, outdoor ficus trees are getting all kinds of thrips, new thrips, and it makes their leaves roll up and they're inside the rolled area and you can't, it's hard to wash them out. So 
so. Are the thrips the dark ones? Well, thrips, all thrips are, the the young thrips are light amber colored, uh, the adults are darker. Oh, okay, because I've seen white ones that fall with thrips. Oh, yeah, thrips uh, kind of are slender creatures, kind of pointy. When the adults, they have little wings on them too when they fly around. But they're they're so small, they're like the size of slivers. So don't know. I don't know how effective it is. Uh, it's more effective on crawling things on the ground. No. Uh, so diatomaceous earth is uh, um, an organic product. What it is, it's essentially it's glass. So it's so diatoms are sea creatures that make shells that are very sharp, and it's the same material as sand and glass. It's still it's quartz. So it's just quartz little shells, and you expose an insect to that. Insects are the only reason they don't dry up is because they're covered with wax. And if you get the diatomaceous earth on their legs, apparently it scrapes off too much of the wax and they dry up. You know, they just dry up. Uh, now, pill bugs aren't insects. They don't have any wax on them. They can, they can only operate at night under high, you know, high humidity. So diatomaceous earth does nothing for pill bugs. But any true insect, supposedly, if you put enough diatomaceous earth on them, but usually it's easier if you just the diatomaceous earth on the ground, they crawl through it, it kills crawling bugs on the ground. So let's see. So that's your most of your insects. Uh, again, diseases. Now there are some diseases, unfortunately. So we talked about bacteria and fungi that are spores that the water droplets get into the plant. Unfortunately, we also have viruses and bacteria that are spread by bugs, and those you can't really do anything about. Uh, there is a bacteria out there that's really nasty. They said uh, 2013 it wiped out 80% of Baja California's tomato crop and 50% of San Diego's tomato crop. And that same year we saw it in our yard. So what happens is the tomato plant grows, it does real well until it's about five or six foot long, and suddenly entire stems start dying. Because when, when one of the bugs, it's a tomato, uh, potato psyllid. So this bug called a potato psyllid that attacks tomatoes too. Oops. They look like miniature cicadas. If you know what a cicada looks like, it's got these wings that are very lacy, well, veiny. So it kind of it's kind of a triangular shaped bug, and it sits on your plant and sucks on it. If the sucking itself doesn't do much harm, but if it's carrying the a bacteria, then it can uh, cut off the circulation from the point they suck on it, which means the entire stem just dries up. The base of the plant's fine; it regrows but you're losing all your stems. And we saw that in 2013, 2014, 2015. Uh, nothing you do about it. Now, the way the farms treated it, and the only thing they could do, they said they had to put a systemic in the field to poison the plants before they started to plant them. We're not about to do that. So the systemics that they're using, Merritt is one of them, uh, poisons the sap coming from the roots going up to the up to the leaves. In theory, the fruit is attached to the backwash. the The system that goes from the leaves down to the roots is a totally different system, not connected, except at the cell and the leaf. So the tomatoes supposedly don't pick up any of the systemic at all. If you believe that, go ahead and use that, but. You know, I just don't want to take that chance. But they said that a lot of the commercial farms between in San Diego County and in, in Mexico had to do that to save their crop. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, blast that, well, and, and blast the water too. Uh, and they, I mean, you can use things like um, traps also. So a lot of the pests that find that suck on leaves, they're attracted to kind of a chartreuse yellow. And there's another, some other ones like the, the leaf miners are attracted to blue, so they make these sticky traps you can hang up that they're attracted to those colors and they get stuck on them because they're covered with this glue stuff. So that's another thing you can do. They said, though, um, put the trap, don't put the traps near your plant. <laughs> put them away from them. Because if you put the trap near your plants, you're drawing all these bugs toward your garden from across the street. So uh, maybe put the trap on your neighbor's house, you know. <laughs> they can go over there. Okay, so there's a few physiological problems that can happen also. Um, the most important one would be, uh, well, I'll write it up here, it's uh, blossom end rot. So on a tomato, when it's growing, it's attached up here, the bottom end sometimes gets hard and black. And they call it a rod, but it's not a rod, it's a lack of calcium in the fruit. And a lot of times, you can have plenty of calcium in the soil, and it still gets it because the plant's roots haven't developed well enough to pick it up or the tomato is just too big. So a lot of the larger beefsteak types get this blossom end rot because they're so big the plant cannot supply enough calcium until it's more mature or even sometimes never. So they make this one called, product called rod stop and it's just calcium, 1.6% calcium. And you spritz it on the developing tomatoes as they're growing, and it's and it just you know just the fruit, just that fruit, just spray the fruit, uh, and it uh, keeps them from developing that rot spot on the bottom and that hard spot. The same thing can happen on peppers, cucumbers, squash. The the blossom end or the far end of the fruit can get a hard spot. Um, Bitter pit and apples, hardened brown spots within the fruit itself, also calcium. So this product's used for all those different fruits. And you spray the fruit. You don't spray the leaves. You just spray the fruit as it's growing, like once a week. If you were to put calcium in the soil while the plant's young and growing, would it then have enough to not need that spray? It may not. Okay. Uh, yeah, some plants just don't ever have enough root to do it. And even sometimes they said the plant has enough calcium in it, it just can't get enough into that huge fruit. So it's it's yeah, some it's just genetics. It, you know, someone created too big a fruit <laughs> for the plant to handle. It's pretty much just a. So if you looked at the tomato and the bottom, this is the bottom tip, then the whole area would be sunken and brown, and it'd be hard. There's a picture on this bottle, but it looks just like that. <laughs> it pretty much looks just like that. It's... Okay, so let's talk a little about training them. Now, you can start them from seed. And usually we start them in little tiny pots in a, in a hot, on a hot heat mat. Because tomato seeds don't sprout well unless it's at least 70 degrees. So it's been pretty cool, even in your house, you know, unless you keep it really warm in there, like 75, the seeds don't sprout very well. Um, we notice in our greenhouse, which is unheated, unless the daytime temperatures are well, unless it gets like 90 degrees in there, over 95 during the day, uh, the seeds won't, just won't sprout well. Now on a heat mat, indoors, the heat mat usually keeps the soil in your little containers about 20 degrees warmer than the air temperature. That's warm enough. So the heat mats do work or else the seeds won't start until it gets like April or May when you can get your the daytime temperature underneath plastic or something, you know, I used to have a little 
plastic hut to start my seeds in in April because it would be 100 degrees inside and it'd be warm enough to get the seeds started, but uh, they have to be pretty warm uh, in order to sprout. So 75 degrees average temperature or it's got a cycle like uh, 60 at night and 85 in the day to, to get these things going. So it's got to be pretty warm to start the seeds. And then, and then when they first start, a lot of seeds, now I, I haven't worked with tomato seeds enough, but in general, when, we, when the seeds first come up, the first week or so they're up, they're real sensitive to being watered on. So you just kind of, you know, if they're in little pots, you just put them in a tray of water, keep those stems dry for a while, and after a few weeks they get taller, and then they become immune to uh, diseases that affect the stem. And then you can get the stem wet again uh, and water overhead. So we we're real careful with most seedlings that way. Some seedlings are much more sensitive than others, though. Tomatoes, I don't think, are the most sensitive to that. They call that damp off disease. You get the stem wet, it gets fungus growing on the stem, and there they go. But as they age, a few weeks down the road, they're fine. Um, I had a friend who, was, uh, who grew tomatoes for the farmers. And what they would do in their greenhouse is they have, have the fans going. They said they fertilize them very minimally because the farmers want their little tomato starts to be yellow and real thick stems so they because uh, they plant them by machines. They couldn't be these little tender little green things that we sell. I mean, you know, some of the, well, I didn't bring the most tender ones in, but they don't like them looking like this. They're, they're, they said there's too much fertilizer in that plant. So the farmers want them kind of paler green or yellowish, so they're, and that makes them tougher. They said it's, they're tougher because they're growing slower. And then they put them in the ground and fertilize them like crazy to get them going. But, uh, but yeah, he was a, he grew the plants for farmers, and they liked it a certain way. So if you blow wind, so when you blow, when plants are blowing in the breeze, they get tougher. So most of the greenhouse growers who grow tomato plants have fans going on. Well, they found out you don't need a fan blowing on them constantly. If you go through your greenhouse and just hit the plants once a week, they become just as strong as a constant breeze the entire week. So you have your options there. You just, you know, brush them once a week, and they... Just the fact that you bend the stem makes them get a thicker stem. What it does microscopically is it breaks the adhesions between the cells and they re-glue re those cells together and it becomes thicker. So that's what that stuff does when you do this and the plants get thicker. Yes? Is the, the thicker stem kind of also for a housing growing stem? Does it help? I don't know if the stem thickness is a big, big deal or not. I mean, generally when you're choosing plants to grow, like if you have 100 seedlings, you'll choose the thicker ones, not the skinny ones. Genetically, I guess that can happen too. Just genetically, it's, it comes out thicker. Well, a lot of people like to start them in little plastic bags with wet paper in there so they don't waste a pot because not all seeds sprout, not all seeds do well. So, you know, generally if you're starting in little pots, you put two in there just because, you you know, tomato seeds you get about 85%. Well, usually on the little package, they'll tell you what the percentage germination rate is, and it's not usually 100% or never is 100%. So if you put one seed in each little a little pot, then you're not you're gonna have some blank pots. If you start the seeds first in the little plastic bags so you can see which ones are growing, then put them in the pots. Might save a little bit of work and a little bit of money. But it doesn't necessarily speed up the, the time or increase the time if one way or another. Well okay the advantage of being in a plastic bag is that it's warmer in there than if it's in a pots without you know if the pot's under plastic, it's warm. Okay. If it's exposed to the air it's evaporating water and it's cool. 
so you can get it warmer inside a plastic bag than you can in a pot sitting on a on a on a windowsill. But if you cover the pot with plastic, then it's as warm as the bag. So, yeah, it's and it's more humid and all that, so it it might speed it up that way. But you can do the same thing in a container too. So, and if your seeds are real expensive, sometimes it's better to start them not in a pot, so you can <laughs> you don't waste your your pots. Okay, so training them. Oh, okay, there's two kinds of tomatoes. Um, although we rarely see the other one now, so there's, most tomatoes that are sold are called, oh, thank you, are called, well, indeterminate. And then there are determinate. So the indeterminates are just plants that are, have apical dominance. So they will grow a stem that grows up, and each stem that grows, they'll be about a foot from the edge. They'll start to make flowers, and as they grow, continue growing, those flowers become fruit. And then it's bare down here, and they'll just continue growing. And so the whole stem has got a sequence of flowering parts, and where the flower develop fruit further down as it grows, and they can have multiple stems that all are doing the same. They're continuously growing, making new flowers that turn into fruit over time. Whereas the determined tomato, they tend to branch out, and each stem flowers and fruits at the same time, so that Everything turns into fruit at once, and then it's done. So most of the tomatoes that are due to become ketchup, the farms use determined tomatoes because they don't want to do any work on these things. So they just plant in the field. They all become ripe fruit at once. They just run the machines through there, gather them up by machines, process all the tomatoes for tomato sauce, and they're done. Whereas most of the heirloom tomatoes are indeterminates, so they can you know, gather them real carefully, one at a time, as this thing grows taller and taller. And most homeowners would rather do this than this, unless you're into canning, where you want our tomatoes to ripen at once. Now the determined tomatoes can make another crop. Most pepper plants are determined, so they make a crop, and then when that crop's done, then they start in their second crop. But most farms, you know, this they just pull them out once the first crop's done. They just pull the whole thing out, start another crop of something else. The indeterminate tomato plants in, uh, can live indefinitely, but uh, our winter usually messes them up with all the rain and stuff. They get diseased eventually, and plants die when they're when the soil gets too full of their dead roots. So that ages them after a while, but they can actually, again, again in hot houses, you'll have the same plant sometimes three or four years. Now I'm starting to go more into, you know, a friend of mine, Steve Goto, he told us, because he was a commercial farmer for a while, he learned how to do it, why they use this a single stem. It makes sense why they do that. Um, for us, most homeowners, they just let everything grow, get all these stems. Um, the, the main pr reason why, especially hothouses, go with a single stem is that they place all their tomato plants about two feet apart. And there's no room for any side branches. So they will start their crops exactly with how many stems they want to be fruiting. Whereas in the garden, if you have one plant that starts and then you let it branch out, they need room to grow. This one plant may take 10 feet of room in your garden to spread out for all these stems to be productive. If you gather them up into a cage like this, then half the stems probably can't get enough light to be fully productive. So even though you're getting more fruit than a single stem would, you're probably not getting as much fruit as, say, eight single stems could. 
So you've got more full, you know, I don't know that there's any disadvantage to having more stems. You, you're just going to get the same amount of fruit as, say, one or two stems would. So, plus you have so much foliage in there, you tend to get more bugs and diseases happening in that, too. So the hothouse growers generally go with one stem every two feet. They usually plant them in buckets about this big. They usually put them in perlite and they water them every few hours <laughs> with their drip system. So that's how, that's tomato production inside a hothouse. Uh, this is a little small for outside. So in hothouses, you know, the sunlight is maybe 60, 70 percent of what you would see outdoors. So they don't need as much soil for much roots. So most people outside, if they're in a pot, so if you're in a pot, you probably want to use a 15 gallon. Now, I've grown a lot of tomatoes in five gallon buckets. And you can get, you know, 20, 30 tomatoes in here. But uh, eventually this is, gets a little bit small. Whereas a 15 gallon bucket outdoors, you can get, you know, as, as long as you maintain it about one stem or so, one or two stems, you can get a full crop off of that. So Steve Goto would show us that he would be growing 415 gallon buckets every year with a eight foot stake in the middle of it, either metal or wood. This is a seven foot stake. But he would just put one stake in the middle of each and just train the stem, one stem going up. He said, you know, because he was traditional, a hothouse farmer, one stem. But he was getting great crops off his plants, so you can't fault him for that. So if you want to try one stemmer, um, this is a lot lighter than this, but you can use either one, wood stake or a metal, metal pole. So as tomato plants grow, straight up, at the base of each leaf, or sometimes right opposite the leaf, They'll either make a little branch with flowers and f that'll become fruit, and you want to save all those, or they'll make another branch. So if you're going with one stem, if you see it turning into an entire branch, you just clip it off. Clip that one off. Get rid of that one. Here's one with flowers. We'll get rid of this branch. This one's coming out with just foliage. So you just keep the one with flowers on them. This one is yet to de determine what that's going to do. It's probably going to be a side branch, though. So you just watch them as they grow and see what they're going to be. And if you, ke you keep the one with the ones that are making flowers and let it grow straight up. Um, they usually tie them to the stakes with stretch tape or a clip. Some people, some, so on hothouse farms, um, Inside the greenhouse, they'll have a, a spool of, of, of twine hanging above the plant that they let hang down, and they have clips. They just clip the plant to the string as it grows upwards. I forgot to bring my little piece of stretch tape up here. I thought I brought it. But you, when you tie it to the stake, so if this is a stake next to this plant, They tie it using a figure eight. Instead of just going like this and tying it, they'll actually go around the stake and around the stem like that. It holds it better, because sometimes when you just tie it like this, it slides up and down through there. So they actually loop it around. I mean, I would say it's probably better to go like this and then tie it to the stake. So it doesn't slide up. Well, you can loop it around here too, so it doesn't slide up and down the stake. Not sure what you meant by that. So you're saying training the, the plant to be a single stand, trimming it and cutting it and doing all this, as opposed to just planting it and never touching it. Would the height be different between the two? Well, this would probably grow faster, but just with the single stem. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you, I don't know, I, when you have more than one stem, each stem kind of affects the other stems a little bit uh, as far as their growth pattern goes. So. Uh, one stem should grow faster than single stem. 
So what they're doing is as the plant grows up, they're working, they said they work with about six foot of foliage. So up here on the stem, you've got the leaves forming and then the flowers and the fruit developing. So you have a whole sequence of things going on. But after about six foot, those leaves are aging at the bottom of that. Start picking them off because the old leaves tend to pick up the bugs and diseases. So they just cut off all the old leaves. So they have six foot of foliage and then bare stem below that. Yes. Yeah, or the the other method is so in hot houses what they do they have it on a on a on some twine and the twine has got a spool up there so as that six foot area climbs higher and higher what they do is they strip the leaves off the bottom and they lay the stem on the ground you know in a circle and just pull it down so on these stakes especially on this metal one you can probably loosen it up a little bit and do the same thing. You can drop the stem down the stake a bit so it's not so high and then just start twining the stem on the ground. Or you might even be able to do it inside the big pot. So that's, so they said they have coil of stem, sometimes 20 foot long, they said, in a, on the floor of a greenhouse as they, as this thing goes up. Because they take so many leaves off? Yeah, they take the leaves off below six, below six foot. Because those are too too old anyway. They're no longer functional. I, I thought for a while that it was a problem with the leaves, not necessarily just that they're ready to go. Yeah. Something that happens, you know, keep that, or else the rest of the plant will get infected or something. Well, well, yeah, old leaves tend to get diseases as they die. That's the, that's the problem with the old leaves, so they pick them off. So with the single stem, it's easier to do all this work. With If you have a whole full plant, you can see it, it's a little more, you know, you, you'll end up with more diseases and more pests. With single stems you can keep it cleaner. So it depends how much work. I mean, sometimes, you know, they'll just have a plant growing underneath the bench and it's doing fine. <laughs> and you can't do anything with it. It's just underneath the bench and it's making fruit and fruit's fine. And so, you know, you can just leave those alone. But if you wanted to make perfect plants, you know, there, there's so much research that they've done with this. This is what they've come up with and it all makes sense. I suppose you could, you don't have to, but I, yeah, you certainly could, you can make new plants. I mean, the one thing about tomato plants is they're, they're the easiest plant to make cuttings of. So one of my employees, uh, this was back about 20 years ago, he'd made 200 cuttings about this long. Just picked them off the plant he liked, stuck them in a pot in the greenhouse, it wasn't that humid in there. They all wilted you know, within a day and they all started growing the next week. <laughs> So if you have a specific plant that you really like, you can keep multiplying it forever. You can cut any, almost any part of the plant to grow in plant? Yeah. Okay, so, so when you're going straight up, if you're cutting some of those things that are, that are branching off to the side, you could repot them and start another plant. Certainly can. Awesome. I mean, if, you know, since, <laughs> since tomatoes are grown from seed, you know, genetically each one's different. Even though we call them hybrids, they're still, each, each one is genetically identical, I mean different. It's, every plant is an individual, unless you take a cutting off, but then it's the same. So if you find, because you, you know, you, you'll come across, say, individual tomato plants that are better than the other ones with the same name, and then you can just keep multiplying that particular one, because it tasted better than the other one. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's why it's called variety. You know, it's, tomatoes are varieties because they're seed grown. And even if the parents are exactly the same, it's like your kids. Everyone is different. They're supposed to be very similar when, they're, when you got the same parents, but uh, you still get a variety. <laughs> Yeah, 
Oh yeah, a lot of farms do it. Yeah, but that yeah that's how the farmers are taught to do it. So. Could you replant a cutting that is the part that's all flower? That's very good. Like if you took just this bit right here, could you then get that to root? I don't. I doubt it. No leaves on it. It's got to have leaves yeah, on it. Yeah. Yes. Well, the ground, uh, I would say growing them in the ground is safer. You don't have to water, you're not dependent on new watering every day. Um, but the ground, you've got to rotate your crops. In a pot, you can get new potting soil. So there's, there's advantages and disadvantages. Like in our house, what happened was we grew them in the ground for like five or six years. Then we said, we ran out of room to rotate crops. So then the next year, we just put them all in pots. And you know, and, and then the year after that, we can put them in the ground again. We had a spot that was finding in the ground, so so it depends, you know, which one's easier for you. Uh, but pots are fine if the pot's big enough. Yeah, if you got a half a day of sun, I'd feel comfortable with that. Yeah. You have no idea. That's why it should be a separate bed, because roots on plants. Well, one plant, if it goes for three months, it probably only made about two or three foot of root. Roots don't grow that fast, but if it was in the ground for say eight or nine months, then the roots may have spread five or six foot wide. So, uh, but you don't know. That's the problem. You don't know where the roots went. I mean, there's there's one method of gardening that that can fail real bad, and that's square foot gardening. So square foot gardening is where they make a bed that's, that's you plant a different plant every square foot. Say a tomato, cucumber, squash, beans, corn. The reason they do that is because when you mix up your plants real good, the bugs can't figure out what you're growing there. So you get very few bugs and diseases in here the first year. But if you don't rotate the crop, then by the second or third year, you run into trouble because all those roots are growing together since they're only a foot apart. Now, what the square foot people have done is they've modified their soil to make that work better. So you notice a lot that they're using vermiculite and perlite and all kinds of really loose materials in there so that when you pull your plant out, the roots don't break off. So when you pull the crop out, the roots come with it when it's in a real lightweight soil is if those roots are still, are still in that foot square area and beyond, there's no way to rotate that anymore. It's all mixed up. So. so anyway, we sell a lot of cages, but if you want to try the single stem method, that, that may be the best, best long-term way to go. It's interesting to see if you want to try that. Uh, otherwise, if it's a low maintenance crop, just put a cage around. Now this, these are the real, probably our more high class cages. Um, they store like this and they open like that. The less expensive cages like this often will break before your crop is over because they're just not strong enough to support the weight of a good crop. Okay, anything else about training them? We need to go over varieties. Oh, um, oh yeah, you can you can train tomatoes any way you like. Right. Just know that you know the most efficient would be to have the sunlight coming in from all directions, which means you'd go straight up a pole. So if you want a single stem to be the most effective it can be, it's all standing all by itself. Now again, um, the problem with this is that if it's only one stem out in the middle of a yard, all these fruit are going to sunburn. So when you do it with one stem, you've got to make sure you've got another stem here, another plant there, another plant. You have to have plants all around them so that they shade their own fruit. The other plants around are shading that. So that's the one bad thing about this method. If it's not in a greenhouse or underneath shade cloth, you've got to make sure you've got plants on all sides of this to shade that fruit. 
So they say if you grow them on the ground, and this is a big mess, they don't sunburn. They might get rot or bugs eating from the ground, but they don't sunburn. But if you grow them on a stake, they can sunburn. So you have to make sure that you've got a whole bunch of these in your garden. What would be the max amount of sun time to not cause sunburn? <laughs> that I don't know. I mean, it's 115 degrees, we're all going to burn anyway. <laughs> We hope we don't see that temperature again. Okay, um, the variety. So, the famous hybrid. So, the, the, the plants that became real famous back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the names that we remember Ace, uh, Big Boy. Pearson. These were hybrid tomatoes from those those ages. I don't I don't remember eating any of them. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, our nursery sold these. They were real famous ones, but I don't remember what they tasted like. It's been too long. So in the 70s, they came out with ones like Better Boy and Early Girl. And these are still sold. In fact, Better Boy is supposed to be the best-selling tomato for home gardens in the United States. Um, not necessarily on the West Coast, center of the country. They said everybody grows Better Boy. So Kansas, Missouri, I guess it has more resistance to certain diseases there, but certainly we still sell it. Early Girl, I really like the flavor on that. Early Girl... Um, I don't think we have any out there today, but that's that's been sold since the six seventies, I think, and it's still a good one. Now, one of the interesting things that so the genetics of Big Boy, um, one of the ways they got the flavor for that is the guy on his dying. He was, as he was dying, he told him it was black crim. So black crim is a Russian tomato. Now all tomatoes are originally from South or Central America somewhere is where they're originated from. But all around the world, they've been growing tomatoes since, uh, I guess, since Columbus brought them back from North America to, or Central America to back to Europe. But black crim is one that comes out of Russia and this is considered one of the most flavorful tomatoes of all time. So they said Big Boy got its flavor from black crim. Um, so they call it a black tomato. It's not really black black, but it, the flesh inside is dark green, which makes the outer skin look kind of brownish. Uh, and it does taste, you can say it tastes smoked and salted when you eat these tomatoes. Uh, it's one of the ugliest tomatoes you'll, you'll ever grow. It's, it's cat face, which has got some funny shapes to it. It's got, cra it develops cracks. But I remember one year when I grew in my yard, along with nine other tomato varieties, the birds went after this one. They like this one a lot. <laughs> so we know it's got great flavor. So that's black crim. That's one of the heirlooms. And then uh, I think in the 80s we had uh, a Champion and Celebrity came out at that time. And they're still sold today. Champion was the top taste test winner in the 1970s, I think, or 80s. And then Big Beef came out. Um... Actually, Lemon Boy came out around this time, too. I mean, if you want to see a, 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 the most productive tomato ever, Lemon Boy just, just produces. I mean, it's crazy how much fruit that thing produces. It's a little on the mild side, although I'm sure there's differences between each seedling. Uh, so it's mild and sweet, but boy, if you want to see something impressive, <laughs> that thing produces a ton of fruit. 
Big beef is supposed to be the miracle fruit. Um, it it can it's really um, resistant to everything, and the fruit looks artificial. The fruit is too round, so the fruit is perfectly round. Looks like a red rubber ball. You go, eh? Can't be any good flavor, but it tastes pretty good too. It's not as good as Earl. I like Earl. Of all the hybrids, I've liked Earl. Well, there's other hybrids too, but Big Beef certainly made a big statement in the in the trade. But the ones that we liked the best came out of Japan. Really, I didn't know that they, a lot of these were Japanese. But Sun Gold is supposed to be the best-selling tomato in the world. It's a it's a cherry tomato, but it's a hybrid from Japan. And our best seller the last. 30 years Momotaro. Now we think Momotaro and Early Girl are close related because they're, they're very similar, um, sweet and tart. It's like very fruit like. I mean, I'll go out there and eat all my Momotaros off the plant. They're, they're really sweet and delicious. Kind of a medium sized tomato, not too big. But quite a few tomatoes are coming out of Japan with American names on it. In the United States, this is called Tough Boy. Momotaro, the literal translation is Peach Boy, and Peach Boy was a fable um, of a kid that was really tough. So they came up, gave him that name. Yes? So, do any of them have a tougher skin than the Yeah, Momotaro. So, Momotaro was developed for a supermarket use. And it won't split. It's got a tougher skin on it, but boy, is it good tasting. And they also said they made it slightly less round so it won't roll off the shelf. <clears throat> but the flavor on it is exceptional. So uh, now they came out with the new one that's supposed to replace the Momotaro. Uh, unfortunately, we're between, you know, we got in a horde of these uh, a couple weeks ago and they all sold out. But I do have Reika, and the same breeder says Reika is taking the place of Momotaro, so it's supposed to be better. This is the only Reika I have this week. We're gonna. My daughter says she'll order a, a whole bunch of these uh, for next weekend. But this is supposed to be the replacement for Momotaro. There's also a gold-colored Momotaro also. Reika comes from Momotaro, or is it just similar to it? Don't know. Same breeder though, and they said it's their replacement. See what the tag says. It says uh, sweet, flavorful, abundant harvest, easy to grow, good shelf life, semi determinant. As far as we're concerned, Momotaro was indeterminate. So maybe this is a, uh, maybe a farmer version. I don't know. Anyway, those. Uh, and then Juliet is interesting. So Juliet. That was the original hybrid that made, that was the original grape tomato. So this is where they took a Roma and a cherry and crossed them. So this is Juliet. So all the grape tomatoes are descendants from Juliet. So this is the one where they, they made this because uh, I guess cherry tomatoes squirt too, easy, too much when you have them in a salad. So they crossed the, the cherry tomatoes with Roma so they wouldn't squirt. And this was the original version of the grape tomato. I mean, the original heirloom that made heirlooms famous is Brandywine. And that's what set off the tomato, heirloom tomato craze in the 1990s. Um, but Brandywines are notoriously poor producers. <laughs> so. That's the problem with it. But when you eat a brandy wine, they do taste like, I don't know, they're real, I would say tomato soup. That's what they taste like. So there's a lot of descendants of that. There's a lot of, but the top taste winners tend to be the black tomatoes. So black creme, uh, supposedly the top winner was black from Tula, I think. 
one, has won a lot of taste test awards. But there are, you know, black, a lot of people like black cherry, chocolate cherry, the darker cherry tomatoes. Um, of course, sun gold is real pop. That's a yellow cherry tomato. The, one of the interesting ones is mortgage lifter. It may be the same as Radiator Charlie. Or may not be. It's a little confusing there. So it's it's a tomato that has probably a more interesting story than maybe the tomato. But uh, this guy named Radiator Charlie, or uh, supposedly was a um, mechanic back in uh, Virginia, I believe it was, and he was a smart guy. So back in the 1920s, no, 1940s, he was near where all the coal mines were. So he put his mechanic shop, his radiator shop, right at the bottom of one of the hills where the, tr the trucks would have to go up the hill, climb over the hill. He says a lot of them, the radiators just burst trying to get over the hill. So he made a lot of money repairing radiators. But he knew some of the guys from the university nearby, and he liked tomatoes. So they told him how to hybridize, but he didn't want to do all that work. So what they said he did is he got a whole bunch of tomatoes of the real famous ones, uh, Germans, what was it called? I can't remember, he put them all in a circle. All these famous tomatoes and let them breed with each other and then took the seeds and he found what he was looking for and called it mortgage lifter. So he was, he was breeding tomatoes at his um, repair shop and he got a good one from all those close together and he called it uh, uh, Radiator Charlie, I guess was the first name they gave it. But he, they said he made so much money on it. He was selling them for over a dollar a piece, which in the 1940s was astronomical. <laughs> but he got a good reputation, so everybody was buying these tomatoes from him, and he got enough money to buy his own house. So they called it Mortgage Lifter. So, um, so it's got a good story. Yeah, I mean, any you put tomatoes. So on heirloom tomatoes, if you want to keep them pure, uh, what they say to do is to have them at least 25 feet apart. So if you have a, a tomato plant here and no other tomato plants within 25 foot, generally the pollen from those plants doesn't make it to these plants. So the, you can keep the strain pretty pure. But if you put them real close together, then the bees can take, or butterflies or flies, whatever, can move the pollen, or you can move the pollen yourself from one plant to the other. Uh, the wind can do the, you know, move the pollen too. But that's what he did. He just put them all in a big circle, all, the, all his favorite tomatoes, and made one that had a lot of the good qualities. Um, few others to note, green, there's one called Green Zebra that's pretty famous. It's kind of a yellow and green striped tomato. Uh, it's got an interesting flavor. It's got, you can taste both sweet and tart in that one. So, I know there's too many tomatoes. One of our, my aunt's nursery, when my uncle died, my aunt turned it into, let an, an, another young uh, nurseryman take over. Gary, his name was Gary Jones, and it was Hortus Nursery. It was real famous in Pasadena back in the 1990s. But he sent flyers throughout Southern California. I mean, every household in Southern California this is crazy. And they were growing, or they were selling 400 kinds of tomatoes. <laughs> So you got this, look like a newspaper, sent to my house and going, how can he afford this? Well, apparently he couldn't. <laughs> he had fairly wealthy backers, but after uh, five years of doing this, they were like $2 million in debt. So uh, <laughs> didn't know what was going on. But uh, out of that, uh, Scott Digra, uh, was in charge of the tomato program, and now he runs Tomato Mania. So that's how they got started at my aunt's nursery in Pasadena. 
they just started carrying just hordes of rice of tomatoes. But it's like, how do, you, how do you remember any of these when you have 400 varieties? How do you remember what they tasted like? It's just crazy. So uh, we try to stay with the, the main ones, the ones we like. But there's certainly a lot out there, and we're trying new ones every year. So um, on a table right out on a, a, um, one of our carts right out here on the table, my daughter's got maybe a dozen varieties or more of some more less common varieties of tomatoes that you have to find in cat seed catalogs. And then our shelf out here, we've got the more ones that our growers grow for us. Any questions today? I'm sure I missed something. Um, yes. Just to wrapping up everything, um, all the different things that could happen to a plant as young as the one here or older, how, did, how would that affect a, a new seedling that hasn't sprouted true leaves yet or just about to? Would any of these things sort of kind of carry over between a more mature plant and something so young? Not that I can think of. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, they're, they're not affected as much by cold as by rain. So just make sure the leaves dry off. Uh, I really doubt we're going to get anything close to freezing. And that's, it takes, it, it's got to get pretty cold to affect the tomato plant that way. Now, if you want to keep the ground warmer, you know, just covering the ground helps. But if you want to just, you know, throw a trash can over the top of your tomato at night, that's pretty good too. Just to keep the ground warmer and the top dry, it's nice to get the leaves to dry off. That, we're more worried about the rain on them. But again, if you just have one tomato plant in your yard, it probably won't get diseased. There's not enough around it to cause diseases yet. Uh, and, and when it's small, especially. Yes. Yeah, Juliet doesn't say anything about being a grape tomato on it. Uh, the picture shows a grape tomato, but most of the other grape tomatoes are heirlooms which were developed from Juliet. So if, the plant is still there and semi alive. So they I could take it out with the cotton soil, but that was the same. Well you just take a cutting, start a new plant from a cutting. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of plants there's called red grape, green grape, yellow grape. I don't know that no one's put a name on them, so I don't know what they are. Unless someone just took cutting off a of Juliet and didn't name it, you know. They could do that. It's possible. Yes. Do you recommend fertilizing throughout the season? I don't know enough about how much fertilizer they need at all times. I know they don't need a whole lot. It's, but most plants want to have, you know, if they're continually growing, they need some source of it. Although a lot of it is they're just taking it from the older leaves and putting the new leaves. But they'll need a little bit. So, if, you know, with organics, it's hard to overdo it. So just put a little layer, keep a little layer on top, or just put a little bit around the stem of it every month or so to keep it fed. Uh, even just mulch or compost on top of the ground can do that too. Maybe enough for a tomato. Tomatoes don't need a whole lot, so because they keep warning the growers don't over fertilize. That's. Well, we just try to follow. So all the, a lot of those things they tell you are are good, but you can do the same thing with almost any fertilizer. So there's certain, you know, like we get a list. Oop, not that list. Well, well there's a list of nutrients that plants need, and there are, and every plant needs the same nutrients. And you know, if you have eggshells, that's calcium and a few other minerals. And if you have coffee, that's basically most of the minerals also. So it, Epsom salts I would stay away from because that's just two minerals. And if you get overloaded in one, you know, there's a certain ratio that plants like, 
and you don't want to go overboard on any one of them. So it's like, it's like iron. We hardly even sell iron anymore. For a long time, they said, oh, your plant's turning yellow, it must be iron. Well, uh, if it's turning yellow, it's never iron. That's the thing that people don't get. If a plant is green and it turns yellow, because plants can't lose iron, they can't suddenly go from green to yellow. If they come out totally pale, never are green, that might be iron. But once they're green, they can't lose it. So, uh, so you know, that's, that's one of the fads that came around was iron. Iron poor plants, very seldom do we see that. Iron is a micronutrient, it's not a major nutrient in plants. So, so let's go with the good general all-purpose organic or dead leaves or, you know, there's a lot of things that provide the nutrition. So, so. When he dead leaves, you know, old cabbage, old lettuce, that's perfect nutrition. Just put it right on top? Yeah. Okay. Of course, it may not work for a few months. That's the problem. <laughs> By the time it's, it's done, then it, the plant might be already done too. But if you get it, you know, if you constantly do that all the time, then you'll always have a source of nutrition there. So. Well, you can't do much about the temperature with a shade cloth. The air temperature you can't do much about it. Yeah, the burning, that'll help. Or you can just cover the tomato itself. You can just put a paper bag on the tomato. <laughs> or, well, uh, the red plastics and all that, those are used in Canada and northern states, so we just don't need that okay. as much here. Even though we get to in because I feel like the first couple That's months, true. <laughs> That's true. Uh, of course, I don't know if we ever get the, um, what do you call it, the money back from using all that stuff, okay. unless you can use it year after year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.